there was a message in that song, one that we could probably preach about. I have to say that when I get the scripture reading, usually a day or two before a service, it's like having a little snapshot into what Mark's going to be talking about. And uh, I treasure that. It gives me time to really think about what the message is going to be. So today's reading is from Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 39. After that, he went out and looked at a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a large crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling to his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Now, if they had said that to me, I'd probably say something to the effect of, Well, why are you eating and drinking with sinners and tax collectors? But Jesus is a better man than I am. So he said, and I, I love this verse, he said, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. And they said to him, not being satisfied, of course, the disciples of John often fast, off, fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendance of the groom fast while the groom is with them, can you? But the days will come, and when the groom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. And he was also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Will not. Otherwise, he will both tear the new garment and the patch from the new garment will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins and no one, after drinking old wine, wants new. For he says, the old wine is fine. Let's pray. Father, again, you've blessed us with a beautiful day, beautiful morning to wake up to. And we are blessed to have this opportunity to hear a message from your word, to come together in faith and fellowship and greet each other. Father, I ask that you would please be with our brother Mark as he gives us that message from your word. And I ask, too, Father, that you would open our hearts and our minds as we receive the message and let us take it home with us and share it with those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will be seated. I look forward to every Sunday morning having the scripture read by Brother Paul. I know how much he uh, cherishes the word of God and how much he loved God. Not just an exercise for him of just reading scripture, as he indicated, he gets to ponder the word uh, prior to uh, this message. And uh, maybe that's something that I can do um, also uh, if we could get our, uh, maybe not even put it in a boat tonight, but send it out prior to Sunday morning, send it out to you on an email or whatever electronic form. <coughs> And let you ponder it as well. Let's really think about that. I think that would be a good thing. If I were uh, a good educator, that's what I would do. Uh, uh, that's what we, we, we have called what we call pre-reading exercises. And uh, through pre-reading, it, it prepares our mind. It prepares our thinking and uh, gives us uh, something that, um, that we, can, we can look forward to. Not all preachers preach from the same uh, approach, you know, from like they'll take this text or any text and 
they all preach about something completely different. So you just never know. Uh, uh, the charge is to preach the word. The charge is to uh, not add to it or take away from it, uh, but to preach the word. So that simply means to me is that our brother's going to read it. I'm going to give you a, a contextual version of it and then an application of it. That application of it is where some of the differences lie because we apply things differently. We're going to see that in this, in this passage here. Kind of a long scriptures at every stand for all verses, but I pray that you'll be blessed uh, as a result. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time of hearing your word and, and proclaiming your, your gospel, Father. We, we ask that you prepare our hearts, Father, to receive the message this morning. Uh, and I pray that this message will be a blessing and received uh, amongst all who hear it, Father, this morning. And one that could even be shared uh, by all. Uh, be with us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, uh, before I get into the message, I do want to just acknowledge that uh, today is Valentine's Day. And uh, last year, this time, we had a wonderful Valentine's meal, and I missed that. Uh, so, I encourage you to have one on your own. Replicate the love that was uh, on display last year this time. Um, you know, the sharing, uh, that's, that's what it's all about, isn't it, sharing? Uh, I know, uh, uh, as an example, Tyson had a, had, a, had a birthday here recently. Yeah, and so he came all the way to share it with, with his parents, amen? And, uh, and so that's, that's what we do, is we share in a, in a now I say, um, why wait till Valentine's Day to share love? Amen. Mm -hmm. Why wait till uh, Easter to uh, to acknowledge the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ when you can do it all the time? When you can tell each other, "I love you" all the time. Uh, it reminds me of a song, uh, "I Keep Falling in Love with Her." You know that song? Yeah, over and over and over again. It's kind of one of those. Say, I wish it'd be over. over. No, just, sometimes, because there's a lot of over and overs in it. Uh, but it's a beautiful song. Uh, when you, it, it's sung from the heart. Uh, anything that resonates from the heart, I dare say, I challenge anyone, uh, if it's if it's about love, to find fault with it. Find any fault with it if it resonates from the heart. In this passage here, uh, just as a reference, from a point of reference, if you were to if I were to assign a, a, uh, a title to this passage, these passages in Luke chapter 5, 27 through 39, it would simply be, follow me. Follow me. Follow me is uh, two words that are very, very powerful words. Uh, two words that uh, are, are, are changing, life-changing. Two words that are challenging because... Uh, Interim, oftentimes, when we decide, before we decide to follow, uh, or make that decision to follow or not to follow, it's a, it's a moment of trepidation. It's a moment of anxiousness. It's a moment of, of challenge uh, for, for us because we have to decide, is, uh, we understand the command, follow me, that's easy. But follow you where? Follow you where? Uh, reminds me of... Uh, I haven't heard this in a while, but I, but I heard this once uh, about, a, about a man who was going through a grave and graveyard and, uh, <clears throat> and on, uh, there was a, on, a, on a tombstone that said, uh, uh, stop here, friend, as you walk by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you too will be. So come on, friend, and follow me. <laughs> Took out a, he took out a piece of paper and he wrote on there, he says, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> so it, it, it's, you know, follow me is one of those things, where, where, where are you going? Where am I following you to? You, you know, you could be leading me uh, to some place that uh, is not too appealing, uh, some place that I never considered that I would go. But that word, those two, th those two words, follow me, are very powerful, and uh, whether we realize it or not, we answer that call. Follow me. 
whether we realize it or not, we are following our own uh, uh, inclinations or we are following the inclinations of someone else. And oftentimes uh, the reality <coughs> is, is that um, we become content in whichever direction that we are going. Until we hit some roadblocks, until there's a stop sign, until the, 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 the little red light comes on, on on the dash of your car, you're gonna go down that road. And um, it's not always, you know, a good thing. Uh, so God is really not a God of confusion. Let's just start there. He's not a, a God of confusion. He's not a God of chaos. Um, he's not, um, uh, he's not, um, he's, he's not a God uh, of, of, uh, of uh, distortion. He's not going to give you a distorted view of, of, of who he is, a distorted paradigm to follow, a distorted uh, vision of the world. He, he's not going to give that to you and say, follow this vision. No, uh, God is a God of compassion. Amen. God is a God of order, uh, love, and he's also a God of mercy. Um, and as his creation, as God's creation, we have been, each of us have been given uh, those characteristics within us that we can uh, relate to. Because we can be compassionate. You know what that's like. And you know what it's like to, to, uh, to be a, a person of love. You know what it's like to give love and hopefully and, and, and uh, prayerfully uh, to receive love. Uh, you understand what it's like to dwell amongst chaos, but you understand what order is as well. Uh, and you understand what mercy is. Prayerfully, for a Christian, uh, that is our call. We have experienced, you know, the, the good news, the gospel, is that, is that Christ did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. And in that, he has shown us mercy. He has shown us his mercy. Um, so we have to identify with what is good, this is our charge, what is right, and what is pure. In his eyes. Not in our eyes, and not in anyone else's eyes, but in God's eyes. And some, some, and the, the, the hope is, is that you know what God identifies or declares to be pure, right, and good. Uh, you will also uh, 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 deem to be pure, right, and good. Um, but when we do that, it establishes our path. Amen. Uh, it establishes the foot, the footprints, the footsteps that we take. Uh, and the decisions that we make. Here's a problem. The problem occurs, as it did in this passage, that no matter what we do, what road you take, there's always someone trying to get in your business. Always. Someone trying to, trying to, trying to, trying to get in your business and, and, and tell you that what you're doing is, 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 is there's something wrong with it. Uh, questioning what you're doing. Pointing out flaws. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, it's like you haven't seen anyone in a long time, and you, you know, maybe rightfully so, but uh, if, if you haven't seen anyone in a long time, and, and they were a dear friend to you, and the first thing that you, you know, they, they say to you, boy, you sure gained some weight. <laughs> you know, that's like, uh, oh really? Uh, boy, you, you, you're, you're, you, you look like you've aged. You know, that's, you, 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 your skin is sagging there a little bit. What's, what, you know, critical people like that, or, or, or someone when they walk into your house, you know, they right away, they start looking around, say, hmm, why, why'd you paint that color on the wall? Uh, you know, stuff like that. You, you understand the point I'm getting at. Uh, people are always questioning uh, who you are, your decisions, your motives, uh, not everybody, but we have encountered some folks like that along the way. Amen? And, and, and such criticizing, such, uh, such a demeanor, it just sucks the life out of you, uh, number one. But what it does, why do people do that? I used to say, why do people do that? And the reason, one reason, a very powerful reason, is that it helps them feel better about themselves. Let me say that again. When, when we criticize someone, criticize what they have, it makes what we have better in our minds. Our church, you know, you, who, you, 
know, church does that. Ooh, our, our church, we, we do this. Uh, 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 ooh, you went to uh, uh, Walmart? Oh, no, I went to, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Macy's. I shop at Macy's. I don't shop at Walmart. You know, that, that kind of thing. It's always to elevate their own person, their own character. Amen? In essence, they are like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, and they want to lead you to their dinner table. <laughs> and such were the Pharisees. Always getting into, into everybody's business. Now, my brother, you know, stole some of my thunder when he said, you know, they were, they were questioning uh, in this passage, uh, these passages, uh, about eating and drinking with sinners and tax collectors. And he raised the question, because that, that's what I raised. Well, well they, they were, but weren't you there as well? And if you weren't there, then to eat and drink, then why were you there? Just so that you could point out everybody else's flaws and checks and balances to see, you, you, see what everybody else is doing? See, this is the nature of our Pharisee. Pharisees um, were, were very zealous. You know, there's lots of Pharisees. How about, so let me just make it clear. Uh, Pharisees uh, in, in, in the Bible, the only Pharisee that I know of, and maybe there's others, but the only one that I know, the more prominent one that I know that was ever converted to Christianity and saw the light, saw the truth, saw the, the was, was Saul. And, and the only way that that happened was that, that, that God had to, to get in his face Oh, he got into his business and said, you know, why are you persecuting me? Why are you doing this? But in order to get his attention, oh, he had to sit him down. He, 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 had to, he had to take away his sight. He had to take away, you know, he got his attention. That's the nature of a Pharisee. Pharisees were, were um, you know, their, their, their version of, of what is righteous is, is, is centered on uh, keeping the tenets of the law. In other words, um, Knowing what the law says, what it states, uh, what the mandates are, what the requirements are, but not necessarily always keeping them themselves. That's just an innate flaw that we have. You know, we are going to fall short. Amen. Uh, their approach to acknowledging the will of God involved also this thing called judgment. Ah, and that is a problem because when we judge, and point out everyone else's flaws, what's right and wrong, um, it, it corrupts our heart. It, it, it distorts the intended purpose of, of why the laws were given. Yes, they were given to, to expose sin, but it does not accurately reflect or, or define the character of God, because God is about to do something else to show us exactly uh, what he's all about. No, it's not about, you know, uh, don't do this, don't do that, uh, you can't do this, you can't do that, you must do this, you must do that, and, 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 and proclaim it, walking around, you know, like a, like, a, like, a, like a broken record, you know, pointing out everybody else. It's not about that, pointing out everyone else's flaws. God is a God of love. And uh, what was missing in the life of a Pharisee was love. To, to allow people to see the love of God in their lives. Um, and, and God says, well, I've got, a, I've got a plan for that. Jesus had to set the record straight on many occasions to make God's intentions known. That's what he came to do, amen? To clarify what he values in the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl who seeks to be called his child. That's what Jesus came to do. How? By showing the world the true definition of love, grace, and mercy. His command is simply, follow me. Follow me. That's his command. Simple, but very difficult to do. So, uh, I'm going to put on my glasses here because I can't even see that screen. Can you see that up there? It's difficult, huh? <laughs> uh, in, this, in, in our text here, uh, in Luke chapter 5, we encounter, uh, Jesus encounters uh, this man called Levi. Levi, also known as Matthew. 
In chapter uh, 5, of, uh, verse 27, it says, After that he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. Follow me. Now, Levi is a, a tax collector. Hmm. Um, and the Bible says that Levi uh, left everything. He left everything. And got up and began to follow him. Now, I just want to pause on that just for a moment. Because when you are, uh, when you give up what you're doing, it's an act of repentance, in a sense. In other words, I was going in one direction, now I'm going to go in another direction. So when Christ calls us to follow him, he's calling us to repentance. To give up what you're doing, what you thought was good, what you were doing, put it down, uh, uh, put it in the drawer, whatever, put the remote control away. Uh, you know, turn off the video screen, whatever, and follow me. Uh, so that also meant that in, in Matthew's case, that he had to give up his career. Um, he changed his life. Uh, he, he, he forsook his friends. Uh, and he abandoned his financial means. Okay? He, 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 he gave up all that to follow Jesus. Now we have to follow, we have to do some things we have to give up as well. So we should understand this principle. If you're a Christian, a believer, you understand that what it's like and what, what he's talking about to give up and follow me. Um, and then to, to celebrate uh, this new, new life, he gives a party. He has a big feast. Uh, and, and, uh, and he invites uh, his friends, tax collectors, <laughs> and many others. Jesus was invited. Uh, the disciples obviously were invited because he makes mention of them. There were others that were invited. Um, and what I want you to see in this, in this, where it says that he invited uh, tax collectors, well, he's no longer going to be a tax collector. Amen? But he has acquaintances who were tax collectors. So in other words, what you were doing, what we were doing before, I'm not going down that direction because there's, you know, we're going to talk about what a tax collector is and who, who they, you know, how they were viewed and all that. But you guys, I'm, I'm going in another direction, but we can still be friends. I'm going to invite you to my, to my, my shindig. I want you to come and feast and drink so we can have our differences and still be friends. Amen. What a what a concept. What a, what a wonderful concept uh, to have our differences and still be friends. Much can be said about that. But let's move on. Um, there was a problem. What was the problem? The Pharisees, according to them, the problem was that eating and drinking, they were eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. Well, let's talk about tax collectors. Tax collectors were uh, employed by Rome. Well, you had, there's two terms, tax collectors and then there's a publican. You heard that word in the scripture? Uh, there's a publican. Now, the, the publican, uh, the Greek word, the, the translation of it is a little different. But in this case, a publican would have been like a chief tax collector, uh, which um, we're gonna, we, we encountered one uh, by the name of Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus? We're going to talk about that a little later. But Zacchaeus was, the Bible says, was a chief tax collector. And tax collectors, uh, in which they didn't go out and collect the taxes, but they hired other people to go out and, and collect the taxes. And were they uh, welcomed by, with open arms by, uh, by their, their, their subjects? No, they weren't. Why? Because all the taxes went to Rome. They went to Rome. And the problem was, was not only did were, the, the, uh, were, were they required to pay taxes, but now you have tax collectors who say, we are going to collect a little bit more than what we paid the Romans. And so tax collectors were wealthy folks. Oh, they had money. This guy had money. Uh, Zacchaeus had a lot of money. Uh, it was hard to find a poor tax collector because they, they took everybody else's money and gave Rome their portion and 
they kept their, their portion for themselves. And Rome didn't have a problem with that. They didn't have a problem with that. So <clears throat> uh, they weren't, they were, they were viewed as, as uh, sinners, uh, the evil, the, you know, the darkness, the, the, the uh, folks you don't want to be associated with. And so you're having uh, eating and drinking with tax collectors. Um, why is this a problem? Why is this a problem? Uh, and at the bottom, I said Pharisees were at the party. You were there. It's such a problem. Why were you there as well? <laughs> you're eating and drinking. Maybe not. But if not, then why were you there? Uh, that's a problem they had. Uh, from this point on... <clears throat> I'm going to, I have a bunch of scriptures listed here. Uh, I'm going to be commenting, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I put them up on the screen here so that you can turn, if you have your Bible or a copy of the Bible, you can turn to them uh, at, at the appointed time. Uh, Jesus' response. Jesus' response. In verse 31, Jesus says, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. Hmm. And in verse 32, he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, he says, the folks that are righteous, you don't need, there's no hope for you. In this case, the righteous person he's talking about, part of the Pharisees, ain't no hope for you. Uh, I'm not going to waste my time with you. Um, uh, but sinners. Now, if for those who are not righteous. Now, the thing about tax collectors, <clears throat> which makes them different uh, than, than uh, the Pharisees, is that the tax collectors knew, or at least they were able to repent and give up doing what they did to follow Christ. That's a major difference. Uh, we see this here in Matthew or Levi. That's what he did. We also see it in, in Zacchaeus, and, and we'll We'll read about that uh, in, in, uh, in just a moment. But sometimes we don't go to the doctor. Christ says he, he's like a physician. We don't go to the doctor. Why don't we go to the doctor? Perhaps we don't know that we are sick. You think the Pharisees knew they were sick? No, they probably didn't. Not, you know, in their mind, I'm righteous. I, 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 I fast, I pray, I, I tithe, I, I do all the things that I'm, I'm, I'm commanded to do. Yeah, right. Uh, perhaps you know that you are sick, but you think you will get better on your own. Anyone ever have that? Oh, coronavirus. Oh, I'm sick. It ain't corona. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, Sister Savoy. How you doing, Sister Savoy? Good to see you. <laughs> she probably had something like that go through her mind. Oh, it's just a little cough, a cold. You know, I'll get over it. You, you don't think you need a physician. Amen? Uh, you don't know that you need to go to the doctor. Some things you just need to go to the doctor. And then lastly, perhaps you know that you are sick and know that you need to go to the doctor and know there is a doctor, but you know what the doctor will tell you to do and you just don't want to do it. Don't want to do it. Some reasons why we don't, we don't go to the doctor. But Jesus says, I have come to, to, um, uh, to call the righteous and sinners to repentance. See, Jesus is always available. He's always available. Doesn't cost you anything. Uh, he's even paid the doctor's fees. You know, it, it, you can look at it that way. Um, so, that's one problem that we have. Uh, in verse number 32, he says, I have come to call the righteous, uh, not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is a, a profound purpose statement. I mean, if, if you don't get anything from what Jesus has, has ever taught, understand that. That he didn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Um, in Luke chapter 18, here's our first, uh, first scripture, 18, verse number 9 to 14. He says, uh, now he also told this parable, parable to some people who trusted in themselves. And I highlight, highlighted that they trusted in themselves and that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. The Bible says they trusted in themselves. Uh, and, and if ever there's a definition of one who needs a physician, 
It's this person here. He says, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and began praying this in regard to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, crooked, adulterers, or even like this tax collector standing some distance away. Uh, um, was even, but the tax collector standing on, on, on some distance away, oh, I misread that. Let's go back. So one of the, or even some tax collector. I fast twice a week. Here we go. I, I pay tithes uh, of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to raise his eyes towards heaven, but was beating his chest, saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other one. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So the tax collector, he, he didn't exalt himself. The Pharisee, did. Great comparison. In Luke chapter 19, here's our other, other passage, uh, verses 1 through 10, gives the account of Zacchaeus. It says, uh, Zacchaeus entered Jericho, or Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. And he was rich. He was a rich tax collector. And he was a chief tax collector. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, the Bible says. And he was unable due to the crowd because he was short in stature. Mm -hmm. I never had that problem. Maybe when I was a kid. So he ran on ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree in order to see him because he was about to pass through the way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for today I must stay at your house. Another sinner. Another publican. Jesus is saying, I need to stay at your house. You see, he recognizes that there's hope in, 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 in uh, ministering to uh, a, a tax collector. Uh, and he hurried and came down, the Bible says, and received him joyfully. When the people saw this, they all began to complain, saying, he has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. But Zacchaeus stopped and said to him, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I have given to the poor. And if I have exhorted anything from anyone, I am giving back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. So he came to seek and save that was lost. He found Zacchaeus who was lost. And, and guess what? Zacchaeus heard the call, follow me, and he's following Christ now. He heard the call, come down out of that tree, and he welcomed him into his house. He heard the call, uh, 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 and, and, and not only did he do that, his, 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 his method of, re of repenting was, first of all, to admit that if he took anything from anyone, that I'm going to pay it back fourfold. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm exposed, I'm out there. And, 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 and uh, this was a, a telling moment in, in, in uh, the life of Zacchaeus. And it could be for us as well. The second problem was not fasting. The purpose of fasting, in verse number 33, of fasting, we do this to suspend uh, satisfying our physical requirements to focus on spiritual uh, 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 offerings. In other words, you deny yourself something that your body requires Physically, food. In this case, it could be you know a uh, drink. It could be you know any anything of that nature, for the purpose of allowing your your you know your 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 being and your heart and your mind to focus on offering up spiritual sacrifices to God. That's the purpose of fasting uh, in, in this case here. Um, and they said, why don't your disciples do the same? Uh, we don't see them fasting. Uh, our disciples fast. John's disciples fast. What about your disciples? Jesus' answer was very, very interesting. Uh, verse 34, 35, he says, Weddings were a time of celebration. Uh, weddings were a time of celebration. Uh, they were held in, in high regard. When there was a wedding, uh, 
you know, you ate and you drank. That's what you did. You know, I, I, I want to I wanna say this. Uh, when Jesus went to these, these meals and, and ate and drank, was he drinking wine? You decide. <laughs> you decide. Was Jesus drinking wine like everybody else? You decide. The Bible doesn't say he was, but it doesn't say he wasn't. But I know there was some wine drinking going on. They weren't drinking grape soda. <laughs> they weren't drinking milk. <laughs> no, no, they weren't. Uh, Jesus said to them, uh, in verse 34, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? You can't do that. Because this is a time that the bridegroom is here. Why fast? No, we are going to celebrate because the bridegroom is here. We're going to, to eat and drink. Now, there's other implications uh, in this passage as well, in that um, we know that Jesus is oftentimes referred to as the bridegroom of the church. And the church is his bride. So, you know, he's, he's proclaiming something that they just don't understand. They wouldn't understand it. They ain't ever heard it. And, and so it, it's going over their head like a parable. Amen. In verse um, 35, it says, But the days will come, and when the bridegroom is taken away from, from them, uh, they will fast in those days. The days will come. Again, prophetic, prophetic. Things are, gonna, are about to happen. Um, uh, and then he went on in verse 36 and 37, and I'm almost done, to talk about a parable. He gave them this parable of wine, new wine, and wine skins, and also uh, putting a new garment, attaching it to an old garment. And the reasons for, you know, he, he, he posed it in, in, in the form of a question. Uh, he says, uh, no one, or, or a statement in this case, no one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it in an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new, uh, and the piece from the new will not match the old. In verse 37, and no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out, and the skins will be ruined. Now, um, parables are to be interpreted. Um, I'm sure that they had no idea what he was talking about, uh, what he was really talking about. What he's really talking about is, is change is coming. Uh, these things that you are are holding high to high esteem your approach to worshiping God and acknowledging uh, God, there's a change that's coming. Uh, in other words, uh, he didn't come to reform what was in place already. He came to change what was in place. He didn't come to, to, uh, to put a patch on, on, uh, on, on your way of thinking, to, to put a patch on the law. He came to change the law. He came to, to establish a new way of, of, um, of what God uh, deems to be righteous. Righteous because, again, uh, the law was unable to make anyone righteous. That paradigm is an old paradigm. Um, uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, old paradigms can be like this. Uh, when, when you say, I, I will believe it, uh, when I see it. I believe it when I see it. A new paradigm will be uh, you will see it when you believe it. Amen? Uh, think about that. Instead of saying I will believe it when I see it, what will actually happen is when you, especially when you give up and follow someone, when you, it says you will see it when you believe it. So you got to believe it first, and then you'll be able to see it. Amen? Um, so you can't put new wine into old wine skins. And the reason is simply that wine ferments and it bubbles and, you know, it expands the old wine skin or the wine skin that it's put in, and it stretches it out, and it's done its task, the wine skin has. Um, and then you go and put new wine into it. 
it's going to cause an explosion. It ain't going to be able to hold, you know, to withstand more ferment, ferment, uh, fermenting and, and bubbling, expanding of gases and things like that. It's kind of like, uh, you know, you got to recognize when something is old that you need to put it aside. Kind of like, I had to learn that the hard way. Back problems and the things that I have that I struggle with, um, I like to play basketball. And even up to about the age of 50, and I'm still thinking I'm Michael Jordan. <laughs> I'm still thinking, you know, oh man, come on, you elbow me, I'm gonna elbow you. I can jump, I can run, I can, and the last time, and, 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 and what began to happen at around the age of 35, which when you look at the career of sports, guys who are in sports, they don't last, you know, at, at, you can't play at a high level without injuring yourself. You get a torn Achilles, your knees start going up. Why? Because they get, oh, and you can't do all the things that you used to do when you were new and young, fresh out the gate. You can't do it. So at some point, your mind's got to say, I'm hearing your body. But if it doesn't, you're going to keep going out there and you're going to, you know, keep, you know, acting like a, a you know, trying to live the glory days and acting a fool and, and following what you do. It's, it's hard for us to give up things. It is really hard for us to give up. But just think about some of the things that we, we, we probably should give up. Uh, I, I guarantee you, I could probably ask each one of you to go into your closet or into a drawer, and you have some from way, way back that's collected dust that you have, and you, you just won't give it. It's just there. It's not doing anything. It's just there, you know. And every now and then you come across it. I came across something the other day as I was preparing this sermon, and I guess what I did? I looked at it, and I threw it in the trash. Praise God, I did. But it was something that was given to me, you know. But we have a difficult, such a difficult time giving up stuff. And what, what Christ is, is, is he, he's well aware that the Pharisees are going to have a difficult time. Well, they have a difficult time uh, in this command uh, to follow me. God is about to do something new. You don't put a, a, a new piece of cloth on, a, on an old piece of cloth to patch it up. Because when that new piece of cloth shrinks, if you know anything about, you know, well, today they have pre-shrunk stuff you can buy but back in the day, no, they didn't have any of that stuff. No, you put something and, and it's going to shrink and it's going to pull and it, 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 it ain't going to look right if it survives. At some point, it's, something's got to give. He's about to do a new thing. A new thing. How do I know? Because Jeremiah in 31, uh, uh, verse 31 through 33 says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel from after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. Listen to that. Within them. In other words, this is where I'm going to look for it. Within them. It's not going to be about how well you know, you know, you can point out everybody else's flaws and, you know, you doing the right thing. He's going to look inside of you and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Amen. So God is now saying, okay, we got, we got a paradigm that says, you know, do this, do that. Can't do this, too, can't do that. But you all, you, 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 you used it for the wrong reasons. The people are not seeing me and what you were, what you were, how you were acting and what you were saying. No. What I'm about to do is show you who I really am. I am a God of love. I am a God of compassion. I am a God of mercy, of truth, of grace. All of those wonderful words that we like to throw out. Hopefully we experience them as well. And, and being that this is Valentine's Day, let us, let us, you know, bathe in his love. You know, let, let us be reminded always of his love. This is a day of love, you know. Let us be reminded of his love, how much he loves us, and how much we should love each other. Amen. Um, 
So he's going to look for new attitudes, uh, all at the command of <clears throat> follow me. Follow me. Two words. Follow me. Follow me. Change your heart. Change your, your, your attitudes. Change your dispositions. Change how we treat each other. Change how the, you know, be my representative. If you're following me, uh, you're going to be my representative. John 12, 26 says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. If we are to serve him, if we are to follow him, we are to be his representative. You know, uh, uh, people should see him in us. Period. End of story. Why? Because that's what the scripture said. Amen. We are washed by the blood of Christ each day. Each day continuously. Therefore, each day is a new day. If you're going to sample this new wine, make it a new day. Every day. When we wake up in the morning, it's a new day. Don't let anyone hold you hostage or hold yourself hostage for what happened in the days past. It's a new day. Rejoice in the new day. Rejoice in the blessings that, 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 that Christ has afforded us in the new day. Don't allow other people to get into your business. Don't do that. God doesn't want that for us. In Psalm 51, in, in verse number 10, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. we got to let some stuff go. Follow him rejoicing with gladness and thanksgiving. And the words of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, be imitators or followers of God, as beloved children. And walk out in love. Walk in love. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. This thing that Christ did, this thing, this, this, this change, this thing that he's talking to the Pharisees and pointing out to them, it's difficult for them to understand because they have latched on to something in their life that they're very passionate about. Something that is, is controlling them, that they've allowed to control them. And we need to be careful whenever we allow other things to control us. Be careful. Knowing if it's the right way or if it's the wrong way. Not all things are, that are that taste good. I said it last week, not all things that taste good are good for you. Not all things that sound, not all directions and paths, you know, that look good are the right way to go. And if we are true to ourselves, then we will always consult with God, just like uh, David would always do. David always consulted with God. Should I go in and, and Capture this? Should I go to do battle with these people? <clears throat> Always consult with God. Confer with Him to see if, if, if we are walking in the right way. That's my message. Follow Him. Follow Him because it's the right way. Because He loves us. Because He has done something for us that we cannot do without judging others. Showing them, allowing them to see the love that he has for us. We're going to stand and sing our song of invitation. If you feel um, my prayer is that these, these, this time of, of uh, hearing the word is, is, will not just stay here in this building, but you'll take it with you. Because uh, you're going to be following someone. Follow yourself or following Christ. Just remember, always to follow. We're going to sing our song of invitation. If you would like prayer to make a prayer request uh, or any other spiritual need if you have, make it known to one of us and we'll see that uh, your needs are met. Afterwards I'm going to have a, a prayer. Then we'll have a closing prayer. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you.
you want to stand, please?